Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome uh, to our second to last event. We have one more at four o'clock and that'll be 14 total. So um, I've gotten really good at this. Um, <laughs> but um, welcome to Universal Furniture. Welcome to the Learning Center. Uh, as I've mentioned a few times, if you've been in here, which we appreciate, uh, we do record all these events. Uh, we'll make them available in about two weeks. And uh, if you've registered with us, we'll send that out to you. We'll also promote it on social. Uh, it'll be on YouTube, so you have plenty of places to find them. And good news, if you registered for one, you're going to get an email to watch them all. So uh, you can do that at, at your convenience. So um, welcome to Universal Furniture. My name is Neil McKenzie, Senior Vice President of Marketing here. Um, we have a lot to show you uh, this market. Uh, we have a great new collection uh, up on floor three called Modern. Uh, if you've not had an opportunity to go check it out, please, I encourage you to do so. Uh, it's about 185 SKUs, a lot of different materials, really, really cool. Um, and you can actually pre-order all that stuff today. Uh, floor two, we have some great in-stock looks. And then on floor, the ground floor, floor one, uh, we have showcase our special order assortment, which we have a number of different frames and fabrics for you to kind of peruse. We also have our new special order dining chair program available for you to kind of check out. There's also the designer's lounge uh, at four o'clock. There are some walk-in appointments for the beauty bar if you want a hair touch-up before our party, uh, which starts around five. So lots to see, uh, lots to check out, lots to explore. Uh, just check in at the front desk and they'll be happy to get you set up and, uh, and send you on your way. So uh, I'm gonna hand it over to Erica Surratt, who's gonna introduce this lovely panel on marketing to designers. And there's a lot to learn as there is with a lot of the events that we've had in here, but uh, Erica does a great job. So I'm gonna kick it over to you. So thanks for being here. Thank you, Neil. Um, thank you, Neil, for hosting us um, again for another amazing market event. If this is the first event you've been to at, at, at Market or at Universal, you're in for a treat. Um, I would say it's one of my favorite favorite locations for education. They always put on super high quality uh, designer focused events. You know that in our industry, everybody's doing business in a different way. And so one of the reasons people, designers come to market is to learn, um, you know, tips and tricks and techniques to, to run their business. So I'm super glad that you're here. I am super excited to start our conversation with this esteemed panel of marketing and PR professionals for the home industry. Um, I'm going to let them introduce themselves to you, um, and we're going to talk and have just a really casual conversation. But before we get started, um, I want to ask, <laughs> take a survey from the audience. How many of you um, do your own marketing for your business? Okay. How many of you have worked with an agency or are working with an agency or a partner? Wow. Okay. Does anybody have marketing PTSD? Some stressful, <laughs> yeah, some stressful experience of working um, with, uh, with a marketing partner. Um, we're going to try to address a lot of those questions and concerns today. We want this to be really actionable advice for you. Uh, and we're going to leave quite a bit of time at the end for your questions. So don't be shy. And um, please in feel free after this, um, we'll have contact information, you've got information in your seat to get in touch with us, um, just to ask questions to, um, you know, learn more about our the business and services that we offer specific to interior designers. Um, I will say, on behalf of my colleagues, marketing is a um, you know, a, an essential part of your business. And it requires a really deep understanding of our industry and how it works so that we can serve you the best that we can. Um, so we're all specialized in the home industry, um, offering different level of services. And, and we'll talk about that. Um, so I want to get started. I'm just going to ask, like I said, a really high level question. I want to kind of paint the picture about what what is marketing and what does it mean? Why do you need it? Um, any volunteers about the definition for this this question? What is marketing? What does it mean? Yes? Yeah? <laughs> Front row, hi! <laughs> Yeah. 
excellent. <laughs> I was going to paint a picture of like, you know, imagine pre-internet, if, if you can, um, what it meant to do marketing. And I would say, take yourself way back to the first products or the first services that were ever marketed or taken to market um, and think about what was required from the understanding of who that client is, what you said, who that, who that buyer, that you know, client might be, what are they really looking for? Do you have what they need, whether that's, uh, you know, a vase or a, some flowers or, you know, whatever in a marketplace or a service, right? A specific design service like vacation rental design or commercial design versus residential design. It's a very particular set of, um, there's a formula, right, between what you offer and what they offer, which equals magic. So that's the marketing that we're going to want to get into this this afternoon with you. Um, I love this quote. If you don't know the work of Marcus Collins, he is an educator uh, and a brand strategist, and he's written multiple books and spoken in multiple places. Um, but he says marketing is very simple. It's about understanding and influencing behaviors. And whether you are trying to get your kids to eat dinner or you're trying to, um, you know, get your team on board with a new initiative or you're a politician potentially trying to sell a policy, um, you are marketing. We are all marketing all the time. And so it's not a thing that needs to be, you know, you're not, you don't need to be scared of it. It doesn't need to feel icky. It doesn't need to feel um, like something someone else does, right? Each of us are marketers. And so we want you to really start to think about and take that on and take on the ownership of it so that you can work with the best partner or take that on yourself. So, okay, enough for this introduction. I will get started with Molly. She's going to introduce herself and we'll go down the line and then we'll break into some Q&A. Hello, I am Molly Schoneveld. I am the founder of a PR firm called The Storied Group, where we specialize in interior designers. Uh, my background is entertainment, so I come from a very personal PR point of view. So I do look to every client as there, there's no one size fits all. It's a very bespoke programming based on what your goals are. Um, I subscribe to the Seth Godin School of Marketing where people like us do things like this. And I think it's extremely important to understand that when you're telling stories about your own brand and trying to build a tribe. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. I thought we were going to incorporate these we as can, the questions. Let's do go that on. later. Good okay. job. <laughs> Just influenced me to change the slide. <laughs> Tori, you're up. You might want to do it actually, like, try it this way. Hi. 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 My name, <laughs> my name is Tori Sikama, and I'm thrilled to be here. Thank you very much. And these ladies are incredible. We have become fast friends and I'm so grateful. Really, that is truly my heart. I feel that. So I am an interior architectural and brand photographer. What the heck is that? Well, I help you in all facets of your business from getting your face out in front of your, well, actually in front of the lens so that people can fall in love with who you are, what you do, and want to hire you. So that's branding, and we'll talk about, we'll dive into that a little bit more. That's the BTS. And then the interior architectural side is your incredible design projects, marketing them, how to help you get published and uh, get the recognition that your projects deserve. My background is 20 years of marketing expertise, and then my technical skills with being a published architectural digest photographer. So I know a thing or two. And I hope to impart some of that wisdom with you today and help you grow your brain. Thank you. Hi, everyone. They warned me that <laughs> So I'm switching. Um, I'm Michelle Peranto, and my business partner, Katie Brockman, and I have a boutique firm um, and where we support interior designers as well as brands um, who are best in class in their area of design. We take a very interesting approach because Katie, for many years, um, was a magazine publisher. So she's exceptional at business strategy and sales development. And then I bring 20 years plus of experience in all facets of marketing and PR. I love to share a fun fact about myself that I did not 
spend a lot of time in this business. I actually come from the world of fine jewelry and watches and then jumped into the world of interior interiors and design. I have an unbridled passion for finding ways to tell the story of how things are made. If you have known me, you know that I love to talk about a diamond as much as I like to talk about a duvet and everything in between. Um, and it's really, I will talk about it from the perspective of the materials, the craftsmanship, the artistry that's behind everything. And I feel like it's a privilege to work with the clients that we work with because they entrust their brand and their image um, to us to help their business soar. So it's great to be here today. Happy to share this mic with you today. We're all in love. We thought up like five more panels earlier at lunch today. <laughs> um, hi, I'm Jennifer Simiga. I'm with Ultraviolet Agency and now ultracollective.io. And our digital marketing agency is more on the execution side. So when these genius minds come together and they put your plan and strategies in place, we help bring them to life through a holistic approach through your email, your website, your automated marketing, and um, also influencer marketing. So we partner with really wonderful designers, a lot of the people that this panel represents now, and help to deliver either your services or your products. And um, is anyone familiar with soapstone? Soapstone surfaces, countertops? Yeah, everyone loves some soapstone. Well, about five years ago, we were um, assigned with the task of taking this soapstone, this little known material, and it used to be used in chem labs, and now there are countertops in homes. And that's thanks to great storytelling, digital marketing. So that's one of my fa my little facts today. And um, I'll soon be putting it in my home, which we're renovating. So um, great to meet you all. I'll bring up the rear. <laughs> I'm Francisca Neumann, Neumann. I own the agency FZK, which is all the letters no one can spell in my name. <laughs> <laughs> Started 15 years ago and... Um, now run a team of seven. We're an in-house, full-service creative agency. We do branding and marketing strategy as well as implementation. And I'll tell you my story when the slide comes up. <laughs> um, all right, so we put this panel together because there seems to be sometimes a misunderstanding about you know, what marketing is, what that means for our industry, and what the options are. So we're gonna talk a little bit about that. Um, from the point of view of a photographer, from marketing, from PR. Um, but at first, we're going to start with kind of a big overall topic that all of us are passionate about, um, and it's photography. Um, because we are such a visual industry, as you know, we want to kind of get this off the table. It felt like it was the white elephant <laughs> in the room. Um, yeah, so my, my first question um, is, I'm going to open it up, but it's going to be for Molly to tell us um, a little bit about why professional photography is important for your brand and, and why is that maybe the first place to get started? So photography is everything. And without really stellar photography, we, your PR firm, we just, we can't do our jobs. I mean, it, it's number one. It's the thing that is going to get you clients. It's the thing that editors are going to scrutinize. Um, so it really is so important to get that correct. And we're seeing a trend now um, with photography changing um, pretty much across all magazines. And that is they don't want perfect shots any, anymore. And I've, I've heard an editor recently say on a podcast, you know, they don't want it to feel like the decorator just left the room. And so instead, what they're wanting is homes that feel lived in, but that happen to also look good in, in photographs. And that's a really hard thing to master. And so we do help our clients ahead of photo shoots to talk through scouting shots and to really understand what they need to capture when they're going to invest in a professional photographer, because it is really expensive. And if you get it wrong, you know, it's, it's almost impossible to reshoot for a million different reasons. Um, so investing in a stylist as well, because they really understand how to capture for editorial. And I think that's where designers sometimes are like, yeah, but I know how to, you know, decorate a room, but it's just so different. And so I would say that, and then also just really understanding the lighting and, you know, top tip, like one of the biggest mistakes we see in photography is having 
your lighting turned on in your shot. So turn off your lamps. You want to shoot in natural light unless it's a basement and you just cannot do that. Uh, but it makes a huge difference because it's the difference of getting published and not. In the, and as far as a, like an investment, um, you know, you're looking at starting this, maybe Tori, tell us a little bit about like, when might you think about engaging a photographer, like the kind of tactical side of this? And then how do you spread that investment out over stakeholders? Are there other ways to think about, because it can be a lot and I'll let you answer sure. that question. Thank you. That's a great question. So when should you start thinking about your photography? Well, number one, in your contract <laughs> to ensure that with your, you, client. with your client. Yes. Thank you, Erica. With your clients, ensure that you have photo shoot following installation in your contract so that they know on the back end that you are definitely going to be capturing this with professional photography. I highly recommend I don't know that you can put it in a contract that they not be home and that their pets not be there, but that is, <laughs> that is very important. So if you can sneak it in there. So definitely let them know it's part of the workflow. So starting with your contract, you're engaging with your, your clients as part of this incredible journey that you go on with doing your design projects with your clients. It's months, if not years from inception, to installation. And then on the back end, to not photograph it would be such a shame. So have in your workflow after installation, you shoot. It's a, it's just becomes part of your process. And then in terms of a cost share, building it in number one, if you can, build it into the cost of your project. Again, part of your workflow, building it in. It's an essential part of the design project and it's an essential part of you growing your brand. If you can't do that, then think about a cost share with other stakeholders. So your architects, your builders, your other manufacturers. On the back end, trust me, these third-party manufacturers like Universal, like your lighting companies, your flooring companies, your cabinetry companies, all of the big ones want to have these assets as well. So spreading the cost, what they're purchasing is they're purchasing a usage license. They're not purchasing the photos because that I own the copyright. Whoever clicks the shutter owns the copyright. What you as the designers and manufacturers are, are getting is a usage license for these images. And understanding what you want these assets for is read really your contract. Read <laughs> your contracts with your photographers because they have to know, your photographer has to know, engage with them. It's a collaboration, a partnership. Is it for a website? It is, is it for social media? Is it for print publication? Is it for digital publication? All have different contracts and usage licenses. So ensure that you're reading your contract thoroughly so that you know on the front end that you're going to definitely be able to use these assets for print media or for digital media and not just for your social media and website. I have a question. <laughs> Go for it. <laughs> on the execution side, we do the social media and we work with um, companies and they have something that's embargoed for press. Um, and you want to explain that? Embargo would be when you talk to someone and it's the PR consultant that cannot use these photos yet on your marketing because they're being reserved for a publication. Is there Exclusivity. something? Um, yep. Yeah, okay. So I've been told, and we've done this in some instances where we've gotten permission that we can use like vignettes. Can you talk a little bit about that? And, and if, if that is indeed true and how that works? On the PR side, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. I always tell clients, because of course they want to know, you know, if we have to wait a year. I mean, some publications right now are already working on 2025. So <laughs> that's obviously a very long time to wait. I have never had an instance where an editor has said no to, to running a project because it's on your website. So a year ago, I would have said, don't put it on your website. But now I feel like you can kind of get away with it. If a magazine that's like, you know, really, if it's a print publication that's national, they may care. And in that case, I would say just remove it right now. They're not going to go on your website and look, but they are going to care about your social. 
you can get away with these vignettes like you were asking. Yes, you can post, you know, a little a little snippet of the bedroom or something like that, but don't post your hero images. And the main reason for that is because a magazine wants to debut your project and they they want there to be this wow moment so that it's not kind of like been there done that. You know, once your followers have seen your project, then when it comes out of the magazine, they're just going to kind of ignore it. So I always say just err on the side of caution with your social, um, you know, share stuff in stories, but again, leave those hero images out. Yeah. Um, okay. I, I want to jump into engagement with an agency. If that is something that you're thinking about, you're curious uh, about what does it mean to work with um, a marketing partner, we all have, you know, limited as, you know, business owners or, you know, potential business owners, we have limited capabilities. <laughs> we have limited amount of hours in the day. We have limited amount of knowledge. Um, and so I want to kind of start to answer some questions that we have anticipated that we hear a lot very commonly from designers who reach out to us. Um, and then, you know, keep your, keep your questions in mind. We will come back to them. But I will say, um, you know, my first question, high level question is <laughs> going to be for you, Francisca. Like, what is, what's the first thing people need to, aside from photography, have or be prepared for when they engage uh, with, with an agency or reach out to you? What is it, like, what's the most common kind of question? I think an awareness that marketing is now important. So I'd actually love to see by a show of hands how many of you get most of your business by referral. Right. And it's about the same amount of hands of like, I do my own marketing. Right. So I think in a referral based business, like the interior design industry, you actually market by networking in your local community. You're a people person at heart and you get business that way. And you're kind of like, so why, what, what is marketing on top of that? And how does that fit into my business? So, in our agency, we like to position ourselves as a support role. So yes, you being out there in your local community and building real relationships is never going to be replaced by a website or social media or anything like that. But when you think about being referred to a lawyer, a doctor, someone else in your industry or in your world, you go online and you check them out, right? We all do that. So um, the point there is that you have to look good in that backup role that when somebody referred you, that what they see on your website, on your social, and all of your marketing collateral is coherent, branded, and holds up to what the referrer said about you. Or the editor, because they also will look at so, your marketing. I'll jump in too to say that, you know, Photography is amazing. That's all part of this branded story about who you are. But the storytelling has to be consistent. And, and what we do is focus on specifically helping to define that story, helping you really articulate that thing that makes you different from another interior designer in your area, um, what it is about your background or your you know, experience, your education, your heritage, all of those things that you take and bring into your projects and help you kind of craft a story that resonates, that fits with those clients. But that not just that you're going to be, you know, selling to a publisher, um, but that anyone on your team can articulate for you because you're getting referrals when your lead designer sits next to a potential builder on an air, on a flight. You're getting, you know, at soccer games, you're getting like referrals are happening all, all the time. All the time. <laughs> so keep keep that in mind. Um, I have a question for Michelle and for Jen. Um, just going back to that sort of initial engagement period, like, would you add about what it, what's it like to kind of find the the perfect client for your your business, and and how do you know they're in the right place? Sure. Um, speak about yeah. that a little bit. It's, you know, I think much like you as designers are looking to make a match with a client. You know, there needs to be trust. There needs to be respect. There needs to be camaraderie. And, and you need to be able to sort of bounce ideas off of one another. And so if you are looking to engage an outside resource, take the same approach that you do um, when, when interviewing a client that you're going to potentially work with. Um, I always say too, be authentic and be transparent. Um, 
if you don't ever want to talk about bathrooms, tell me that. Like, that's really important for me to know. And I would say the other big thing is I, I have an expression and I use it often. And I, I said it here today. My magic wand is out for perpetual service. So I can't come in and just make beautiful magic happen in 24 hours. I wish I could for you. I wish I could have clients lined up, but it's a process. But if we really engage one another and we commit to one another, I, I have success stories of our clients soaring and, and their business really achieving the objectives that they set out um, to make. And I think it's that honesty that I really do think is so important because it may be that you're looking for two more great clients or you're looking for 20. Tell me that. Because if I know that at the upfront, I know what I'm working towards. But if you just have an expectation of, I just want to grow my business, I'm going to ask you a million questions to understand what does that mean to grow your business? Um, there, there's an example, if you wouldn't mind clicking back, I think one. Yeah. So Nadia Watts is, is a client of ours and she's an interior designer based in Denver, Colorado. And, and she's my poster child of how to be a great client. I tell her this all the time. Um, Nadia is very open to letting me be what I like to say an anthropologist. I ask her a lot of questions all the time. And so far this year, she's actually been featured in the Wall Street Journal twice. And there's a third one that's happening in December. And it's because she said, I want to go after multiple homeowners. I want to go after the luxury market. And I want to be able to tell the stories about my projects where it's not just a home tour, but really about what I've been able to do and build. And so the story that's featured here was she has a client that she's worked with on seven different homes. And so I went to a journalist at the Wall Street Journal and said, what about the designers that work with a client? over multiple properties, over multiple years. And we were able to craft and bring together the story. So, you know, she was willing to take the ride with me a little bit, answer all of my questions. And it's a, it's a great success because she articulated at the upfront what her goals were. So the Wall Street Journal is read by the people that own multiple homes that have a very high household income. And oh, by the way, that story was featured in the mansion section, which happens to be the real estate section. So. I love that. And I will say, you know, we had this conversation before. We're service providers just like you as interior designers. And so when you're interviewing clients, you're asking them about their goals, right, for their home or for their office, their restaurant, whatever that project looks like. You're trying to understand, you know, what it is that that's most important to them. Um, if it's about, you know, taking time, like giving them time back to do more business development, to, um, you know, from a marketing point of view, like, most of the time, you know, a firm designers will come to us because they realize like it's out of the scope of what they have time or knowledge or insight or team to accomplish. So, Jen, do you want to talk a little bit about what you talked about implementation? Um, and I'm curious if my question is about sort of helping clients understand the value of that, understanding when they should start thinking about that, what assets they need to have set up, how do they measure success? Yep. So how many of you have created like business plans for yourselves? Yeah. And how many of them, you revisit that every year? <laughs> yeah. How many revisit that quarterly? Yeah, it gets smaller and smaller. You're, you're busy, right? We're all really busy, but you wouldn't, you know, drive the car and start throwing money out the window. And I think this happens when you start doing marketing. You don't revisit your business plan. You don't look at what those goals were, what that focus were, like you said when you specifically know who you're trying to target and the part of your business and you want to grow, then you can translate that into marketing materials. And the algorithms, the press, they like the same thing. They like a clear vision. They like a focused topic. They, and then you can reap the results from that. There used to be websites, used to be brochure sites. How many of you have your site up with the about page, um, a little contact information, maybe that contact page is just a way to get in touch with you. Maybe you don't even ask them questions. Maybe you just get flooded with people that you would never, ever even talk to on a regular basis. You don't maybe qualify them. How many of you have that brochure site? 
that just general site, right? So Google would like to know more about you. Google wants to know, is this person work on new construction? Do they work with builders? Do they work with contractors? Do they do families? Um, they do, do they work with um, developers? The more that you could talk about yourself, the more information you could give your website is the conversation that you're giving to the algorithm that guess who the algorithm is serving that up to? Your actual client, your potential client. So if you just have this general website, you're talking to everyone about nothing, you're telling Google that you're not an expert and you're never gonna reach your person. So revisit that business plan, think about what you wanna focus on quarterly, and then that can get translated into the things that you don't have time to do. And maybe you hire someone to do. And the rule of thumb is, I'm gonna say five to 10%. I'd love to see you spend 10% of yes. your revenue on marketing. And what does that involve? That involves a vendor, not maybe the social media person that you have in, 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 in house. It's not them. It's maybe the print material, it's maybe the ads. And it's really creating a funnel for these things. And I don't have my glasses on. So hopefully you can read this. But these are the things. This is the fancy marketing language that we tried to all keep out of this talk today. But multi-touch attribution, um, the different ways that you reach your audience is basically what it means, right? There's organically through your website, social media, direct through a form that they found you on, email, sales, right? Your sales team, they're important. They know marketing is different. Marketing knows sales is different. You guys need to talk together. And if you're a single owner of a company, you're talking to yourself through all of this. But you have to put the different hats on. I'm a salesperson today talking to my marketing person, right? And then a case study of something that's been successful, a uh, successful pro a project to a customer that you're trying to attract. All of that, as you work more on these things, you're going to see which is the thing that brings you the most business. And then like anything else that you do, you do more of that. So you don't have to kill yourself and do all of the things, just do something really well in that mix. And um, yeah, talk to your customers, starting with your website, that's your home base. And that's where, like you said, the, you're directing all of those referrals to, and then Google's gonna find you the new people. And it takes time. It takes at least a minimum of six months of you starting to add to your website. I hope that was. Yeah, no, that was great. Yeah. I will say that's a, a big overview too of marketing and PR in general. Did I that... hopefully not do like your next three questions? No, no, no. <laughs> We're going to talk about trends, okay. but I would say just if you, you know, have a takeaway from this, it's marketing is a long game. You know, marketing takes time to build a relationship and talk someone into something. I mean, I'm assuming you're all doing quite expensive services and it, and your projects take time, right? They're, you're asking for a huge investment in the time, the transition that some families go through um, when they move from their home to have it renovated. So, you know, you're asking someone for an enormous lift in their life. And so marketing isn't going to be something that someone's going to, you know, make an impulse decision about, like buying, you know, lipstick or shoes or a purse or something like that. Um, but I, I think keep in mind that it's going to take a while. Um, Looking ahead, I want to Erica, talk. Erica, Erica, can we talk about DIY marketing for one more minute? Yes, before you it. move on, I want to Do stir it. the pot. Sorry. <laughs> yes, we Not our stir. our next actually next few <laughs> presentations are going to be about like okay. <laughs> new things. But please talk about it. Yes. So DIY marketing, which we have the room full of, so awesome. I think there's an absolute place for that when you're starting out. You know, we have tools now that are really easy to use. You can build your own website. There's Canva by all means, go ahead and do it until you figured out that you're in the business that you want to be in, that your service sticks, you have clientele, you know, you're in love with what you're doing. But I think you get to a point where you're realizing that the bigger client or the next bigger project, or now you're ready to do a boutique hotel, um, it's not going to cut it, right? So that's usually the point at which people come to us and say, okay, I've DIY'd my marketing, but now I know I'm ready and I have to invest into this next step to get to the next point. And we shared this little story. We've all seen it. So when I lurk in Facebook groups where interior designers hang out, there's always the post of, I have this lovely scheme for my client and then she decided to order her own lamps on Amazon and it was a nightmare. We had to rewire everything. It didn't work. It screwed up the scheme. How do I explain to my client that that is not the way to go about it? 
our businesses are actually like exactly like yours. So we get people coming to us and say, please market me, but I've built my own website. Can you just make it look a little better? Because I've already got it. So <laughs> I have a good eye. This looks great. It does what I want it. Um, but just make it a little better and just kind of fill in over here if you can. So that please is not the right approach to marketing <laughs> please please trust us the same way you hope your your clients trust you and marketing is really a full full comprehensive activity once you're ready to invest in it it's the full scope at least have someone like yourself like consult with her show them what you worked on like at least if you can get an expert eye in at some point of your journey it's helpful absolutely thanks for <laughs> Um, I want to talk about trends in 2024 and beyond because, you know, we're approaching the end. Um, we are, you know, looking ahead if you're doing end of year planning for 2024, um, you might want to start to think about what are some things that you can invest in. We've already talked very specifically about photography being, you know, a really important kind of earmark in your budget if you haven't yet start doing that. So my first question is going to be, you know, for Tori, um, you mentioned <laughs> you are the face of your brand. Um, I think that there are some things that um, we've talked about storytelling. Obviously, we are all inundated through Instagram and television in some ways, but through all the media around us by images of beautiful spaces and designers really becoming brands now. Um, it's how your business is growing from licensing to you know larger projects to collaborations. So as a designer who may not be comfortable in front of the camera or expressing themselves that way, can you talk a little bit about how they can benefit from this trend of, you know, being the face of their brand, being their brand and how, how can you help them with that? So I know face is a four letter word. We don't like it. We don't feel comfortable in front of the lens. If only we were 10 pounds lighter, if only, you know, I don't know, my eyebrows were lifted more. Whatever that is, whatever that is for you, please understand that we all are there. We all understand. But it is becoming, it is about becoming vulnerable and showing your true self and connecting with your clients on an organic level that is going to help you be more relatable to those clients that are looking at the sea of options how are you going to differentiate yourself? How are you going to stand out? It's about becoming vulnerable and letting them get to know you a little bit more, bringing those walls down. I liken it to uh, who loves Nancy Meyer films? It's complicated, right? So Molly talks about in photography, the styling trend and what editors want. It's all about the, the un, you know, the livability of a space and showing that, you know, bringing the fail down. We don't have to have the two dozen roses in a vase anymore. We can have a gorgeous organic branch coming out of a, a beautiful vessel and that's enough, you know? So it doesn't have to be perfection. You don't have to be perfect. And quite frankly, we don't want you to be. And so having you as the face of your brand helps you engage with your clients on a level that they can relate to. So that face, that picture, that lifestyle image of you, the person behind the brand, is your handshake with your clients before you've ever met them, before they've ever decided to work with you. So I highly recommend just love yourself, practice self-love and say, yes, I know face is a four-letter word, but you can do this because your design projects are stunning and you invest in that photography but think about Architectural Digest. We do environmental portraits on those shoots because it's about showing who it is behind the design or who lives there. So I encourage you, just become the face of your brand. Show us who you are. We'll fall in love with you. I, I promise. I'll jump in real quick to say, too, that it's so much more interesting to build a story around something original than it is to build something around a copy because you're never going to get to be that thing, that level of perfection, that level, that image of who you think other people want 
to buy from or hire for. It's so boring. It's so boring to be samey, samey. And like you are the only one of you. And building stories for your marketing around that is so much more interesting. And that's who your clients want to work with. Could I'm seeing a trend and you could all let me know if this is true in social media. Like I do have some clients that are okay with the headshot, but on social media are like, I cannot have my face every day. But it is important. Can you do, I've seen come have someone like you come in, they're um, putting the flat lay together, using yeah. their hands to do things, and then you have the voiceover. Like so this is, this is a brand photo shoot that I did for an interior designer. And we actually got this published uh, because it is truly her working with the architect. Not only the architect with the blueprints, but her telling the architect what has to be done because let's face it, design professionals, your input influences a lot of the direction of the design process. Am I right? Okay, from the build to the architect, the designer has a big part to play in that process. Let's show it. People want to know that story. It's not just the finishing touches. It's all of the layers. And this is the beginning of the story. So let's capture that through a brand session. And I guess what differentiates me in the marketplace is that I understand that and I like to tell that story. So interiors with branding to me is essential. It's you can't have one without the other. These are just as important. And just a little FYI, one out of every ninth caption should be a picture of you and your process. I'm going to toss that down to each of you before we go to Q&A, like 2024 trends. What are you seeing? What's important? I'm going to pivot a bit with the trends here. There's a, there's a couple. One is SEO is becoming more and more important in terms of the publishing world because it is how magazines are getting found in search. And it's also what's driving revenue with affiliate links. So if you didn't know this, magazines actually have SEO teams that are directing the editor's content. So what's being searched for on Pinterest and Google is what is now becoming the headlines. So that's something important to know. If you want to get press when you don't have a project that's fully complete, a great way of doing that is giving expert opinions. But let me just say this, editors do not like vanilla quotes. They want something that feels dynamic and a real point of view. So I'll give you a really good example of a client of mine who had given expert opinion to a magazine. And her quote was, let your freak flag fly. And the editor loved it and like called her out above everybody else. And the thing is, when the Wall Street Journal or New York Times or whomever is looking for expert opinions, they're not just coming to us for our designers. They're going to you. They're going to other firms, you know, and whoever has the best quotes is who is they're going to publish. They, they can't, they obviously have to edit it down. So you really need to give thoughtful responses because that's how you're going to actually stand above everybody else. Um, I had another trend. Oh, the trend of uh, brands relying on editorial in their catalogs and in their own marketing materials. So move to the Lulu in Georgia. This, this was, this is not why I'm showing you this, but I'm going to kind of pivot this graphic. So one of our clients in Santa Barbara has a, they, they're trying to turn the bed and breakfast model on its head. And so they had used a lot of pieces that are found on Lulu in Georgia. And we noticed that. And so we went to Lulu in Georgia and said, like, you know, this is kind of a shoppable story for you guys. Would you be interested in partnering with them? And they were. And they did this incredible blog post for us with lots of social posts behind it. So it was stories, in-feed posts, all of it. And, like, that's a really big deal for this client. And so we're seeing that. I mean, Cherish does it. I mean, a lot of places are creating their own magazines or like within their catalogs, they're interviewing designers. So it's also a way for you to get press is working with these brands and being experts. But just remember that like you've got to be interesting because 
you know, it is entertainment. You know, magazine, it's like, yes, you are the expert, but there also is entertainment value there. It's why Josh Flagg is famous because he's hilarious, you know, in every response. And it's a little polarizing, but sometimes you have to be a little polarizing. You know, you have to not be afraid that somebody's going to disagree with your opinion. Michelle? Um, two two trends that that I'm definitely seeing. I think building off of both what Molly and Tori have said is, um, you know, back I would say even five years ago, it, the, the hitting the holy grail was a, a print feature story of one of your home tours. I say to our clients all the time, go digital or go home, and I say that because the the digital footprint that you can leave behind is so much greater than a print story anymore for all the reasons stated. A, it becomes searchable. So if somebody is wanting to find out more about you, you've created this wonderful sort of breadcrumb trail to get to you, um, which is amazing. And the second part is you actually can start to measure things. So if you're featured digitally on housebeautiful.com, for example, Example, you can actually see the influx of that traffic that's coming from that. And oh, by the by, that story lives there in perpetuity, as opposed to the print magazine, the next month happens and where does it go in someone's recycling bin? So I, I really am trying to get um, cl our clients to understand that digital is is actually now our priority. And it should be for you as well, something that you're looking at. The second thing is a very um, specific trend that I'm seeing, and that's um, making sure that you are standing out from the crowd. And what I mean by that is when you're approaching a project, if you're being asked to create, enhance, build a room that not everybody has in their home, raise your double hands and let your marketing and PR and social folks know. Because having that actually is a great way to stand out from the crowd. Example of that is we had a client that was asked to, de to um, design a really amazing laundry room. I know it's not your favorite room to do. It, it's, it Did you say laundry room? Laundry room. Okay. I kid you not. It was like the, the woman who owned the home, that, that was a safe haven for her. She could go there. So our, our client created like a little reading nook in there for her. There was a little refrigerator. And so she's telling me about this and I'm salivating thinking there's going to be a home for this story. Um, and it is, it, it is going to be, um, it, it published digitally, actually, in, in a regional publication, which is going to be really meaningful. But my client said to me, I actually wasn't even going to tell you about this because, I mean, it's a laundry room. And I was like, no, 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 that's the lead of the story. That's fantastic. So, you know, if you have that uniqueness that's happening, that might be a pain for you, you actually might be able to turn that around into some wonderful PR social media magic that can happen. And I think going back to what I said before, having that transparency and that authenticity of communication with any of the resources that you're tapping outside, we're only as good as what you tell us. So tell us everything and then some for sure. And again, if you don't like to talk about bathrooms, I'm never going to make you talk about a bathroom. I promise you. Jen, Francisca. You want to add yeah. anything? Um, I would add to that. I'm going to add to that. I'm going to say something completely different. Um, focus on something well. I think we could all agree we're overwhelmed, right? There's a lot of social media. There's new platforms. People are trying to navigate TikTok and figure that out. If they just got Instagram down and everything's so different. And what about Pinterest? If you're a content creator and you're, again, working on your website and adding information, Figure out which platform really fits your personality. If it's TikTok, if you're okay to be spontaneous and focus on different things, or you want a little more polish, um, think about where you fit and what you can keep up with and do that regularly. Don't, you know, do it one week and then drop it the next week. Again, the algorithms and your audience want to hear from you and hear from you regularly. So just cut yourself a break and learn something and learn something really well and keep up with it. Oh, and to the point of the the relationships and the, uh, the partnerships, unexpected partnerships. 
right? You may not be able to partner with a big brand, but maybe there's someone locally in your region that every time you're at some, a client's home, you share a cup of that special coffee. Or there could be some brand or company that really kills it on social media that you consistently share their product. So think about that unexpected partnership and how you can fit that into your social content as well. Yeah, ditto to all of that. <laughs> it's all good. Um, I'm going to add one trend for 22, or recommendation for 2024. Um, yes, have your digital footprint all lovely. And I think still somewhat coming out of the pandemic, there's still an appreciation for being in person again. I actually recommend events in your local community. You can absolutely host and create your own event that you can sell your services at. Like sometimes people think I have to find a showroom to work with or whatever. You can be the creator of this event and just be the one that gets everyone together and that increases your visibility and I think events are really a powerful way forward in the coming year. Um, I'm going to say two quick things and then I'm going to turn it over for, for your questions. Um, the, the one thing I think that all interior designers that we all share here is that we know interior design has a brand problem, that interior design suffers from being misunderstood as a as a value, like to what we can offer for people's lives. And the best way to counter that, to, to show people the power of interior design um, is to do marketing, is to like get the word out, not just to each other and to, you know, one or two clients throughout our lifetime that we can really, you know, impact, but to a broader, more mainstream audience who will see the value of interior design. That's really what we're all in this for. And that's what all of our marketing does together. So go forth, let's change the world <laughs> in every little, in every little way that we can. Um, so, um, yeah. Okay. And the second thing is we created a little resource um, for you. It's a podcast series where Tori, who has her own podcast called Brand Lift, which is fantastic. This is a link to it behind us. I'm going to leave it up during Q&A. Um, if you want to follow this to um, the landing page, those episodes are, there's a video and an audio accompaniment. You can um, listen to those while you're walking around, while you're waiting on the shuttle, while you are, um, you know, traveling back to wherever you're living. Um, but we really hope that you, if you want to dig into what we all do, we spent time interviewing um, with Tori and then interviewed Tori also. <laughs> so these are just super fun, um, but check that out. We made that for you. And um, we will have that available at this link. Um, and then I think eventually in a couple of weeks, it might flip to kind of a, there might be an opt-in, um, but for now it's open and accessible since you're here and we're really excited. So um, questions, what are they? And uh, I'm going to have to ask you to use the mic because they're recording. And if um, without the mic, they won't hear you, your question. Uh, my question, thank, first of all, thank you so much for your wealth of knowledge really appreciate it. But my question is, what is the best strategy for scheduled posting uh, to get the algorithm on your side? I'll answer. So I would say minimum three to five times a week to have something up and the algorithms are happy, but do it consistently. And they're favoring you to use as many of the tools that they offered you. So I'm not saying do a poll, a sticker, and a video, and a reel, and a post in a day, but like break that up and try to use it monthly as much as you can. Do you use a calendar? Yes. Great. Terrific. What tool do you use? I use Notion. Great. So I would recommend everybody just gets consistent and minimum three to five. Awesome. Something to add. Yeah, I I would, if you really want to figure out the algorithm for your particular audience, I would dedicate a month or at least a week to posting all the time, like post five times a day and read it. Like look at the analytics and see what works for your particular audience. Yeah, I think those platforms really want you to spend as much time on them as possible. So whatever that means <laughs> for you. Hello everyone, thank you so much. Um, I just had a question about email marketing. Um, we'd have a mailing list and obviously we know that it's like our harnessing our power of our website and our presence and stuff like that outside of social media. 
So we sent out a monthly newsletter. I'm just curious about what equates to like what's a good um, parameter or metric to, to, I guess, realize the success of it. Because I know even for me, I don't get tons of email. I'm not going to open them all. So and I think it's be the same for our own audiences. But like what equates to like a successful, I guess, like opening opening rates and things like that. Does that make sense? I'm just going to answer this. Email is my, I'll just die on the hill of email. I love it so much. And I think it's super important. Um, you want to be around, I mean, a good, you want 30% open rate for each of your emails. Click through, I mean, 10% is good. Um, it just depends on the content. You want to, the more important thing for email is obviously you're doing it regularly. You're staying active in your, in the inbox of your of your followers, you're, and, but you're providing them value. Um, and I, I would say clean your list so that your email marketing platform is being accurate with how it's delivered. Because if half of those are going to someone's spam box or they're you know, getting you know, deleted or they're ignored, it's gonna affect the way they start delivering to people who actually read your emails. So just keep it, it's called list hygiene, keep it clean. Um, you know, get rid of people who aren't engaging and really reward the people who are. Okay, um, I wrote down that you said uh, to post three to five times a week minimum. It's like advised. Is, oh, a day. No, I, <laughs> no, I agree. On a general basis, I think three to five consistency, but, but to, try, to try and read your audience, I would do it for a month, like five times a day to really understand it, but ongoing. Like, Maybe with like stories and stuff. I'm talking about posting a post on Instagram. Maybe like stories would be great you frequently throughout the day, but like a post. So I'm just wondering, are there types of posts that you would you maybe aren't a fan of or like, oh, these are not going to work for you um, that you don't like? I know that might be a heavy phrasing to use because I'm really bad about posting stuff and being like, love this chair. <laughs> and I feel like that's not helpful. You know, like I'm trying to sell an interior design service, not, a, not one chair, but it's like I'm looking through my stuff of what I can post and I'm like, eh, I don't really have a big portfolio or anything. What do I do here? So I don't Book know if a photo shoot. You don't like. <laughs> but, or I, I mean, the, the word I use all the time is context. You know, so, so think about it from the, your chair example is a great one. If this is a great chair, but what does that mean to me? This is a great chair for a family that has dogs and kids. You know, try to think about who your audience is and, and what that context is when they look at that image. And I was you just took the words out of my mouth and and use leverage who that brand is and make sure that you're I always say I equate social media to toss your stone in and you remember when you were a kid and you try to have it you know skip as many times as possible that's what you want to do with with your social media content um, you know cr create that story in just that one post um, but your chair example is a great one because we, we see it all the time. But add context and storytelling. Uh, we, we actually build our social media content plans around your values. So I recommend picking like a minimum of five of things that you really stand for and believe on. And so we had an example up there earlier. We did it with a client of ours and we had values like family, collaborations, craftsmanship. Um, so pick some that really are true to you. And then if you post that share, find one of those five values to tie it back to. And then you get brand consistency, you get a message, and you infuse your post with meaning. Hello. Over here. So my question is about budget. Um, obviously, um, everything that you guys say, it's amazing. I will take all of you home with me, please. Um, but what about the percentage, the percentage of your revenue that you should try and is dedicated um, to apply to marketing? I, I would love to at least have an idea. We actually, we talked about this today because it's probably the most asked question of any of us. Um, our, our rule of thumb is, is five to 10% of your revenue. Um, it's, it's an investment and we understand that and appreciate that. But, you know, as my grandmother used to say to me, spend $5, you're going to get $5, you know, so 
you, this is an investment that you're making and there's a short term return on that. There's a midterm return on that. And there's a long game return on that as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. It's, I think, I think the test and learn part of this is also really important. It goes back to the do fewer things really well. Um, I have a question that's a little different than all of these. I Every year I want to do one thing, and this year, of course, it's nearly the end, it was to get a marketing firm. So my question to you is, we have a great business and all. I've been in it a long time. It's Greek to me. So what is the exact process and how do, I'm always afraid that it's not my voice that comes through in marketing. And so I'd like to know how that's all addressed and how I go about, you know, which is the perfect fit for our firm, that type of thing. Let's just make the, I feel like this is you, Erica. Yeah. <laughs> um, so your brand voice is kind of the very first place to start before you engage any marketing partner. You want to make sure that you have your values. You know exactly what helps you make decisions in your business. That's what your values are. Okay. You have, you know, your purpose, your principle, you know exactly what makes you unique and original and different from everybody else. You've got your assets, your photography, your video, you've got it all ready. You've got a budget earmarked for this and can be spread out quarterly, monthly as a retainer. Great. Start interviewing. How would you, uh, you know, how do clients come to you? They, what are the questions they're asking? How are they trying to figure out if you're the right fit? What are your services? What are your, those are the questions you're going to ask, you know, each of us. You, you can reach out, you can dig a little on our websites, which I hope are really clear <laughs> what we do um, and what we offer. Um, from my point of view, I think a message is really important. That streamlined point of view, who you are, how you introduce yourself, your tagline, your brand story, your brand script. Do you have a visual storytelling style? We can help you with all of that. And then how do you, again, do the one thing and pick a few things and do them really well, right? Is that going to be your website? Is that going to be social media? Is that going to be email strategy? Is it going to be you know, other events or physical touch points, those are things your, your agency can help you parse through and figure what's out. Your, what's your company? What, 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 what do you do? Residential. Do you have like a sales team too? Or is, okay. I would also like look at those sales pain points. Like what are the pain points that you have? Like Erica said, the questions. And we love when people come to us with like a calendar, like an outlook for the year. Like are you going to be at an event? Or are you going to be launching? Like what are you going to be doing? Um, through the year, that's really helpful for goals. Yeah. yeah. Like, yeah. do you want more visibility? Maybe you need to work with a publicist. Do you want a new website? That's a whole different kind of set of things. Do you need new collateral? Do you want to rebrand yourself? Do you need, you know, all the things, you know, think about what your goals are first and then, you know, start doing interviews, call people, get on their calendars, get discovery, get a discovery call and get it all kind of, yeah, questions answered. We can stick around uh, for a few minutes after this. So please come up and introduce yourselves and get our cards and we'd love yours. And thank you so much for coming. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you.